Okay, this was, this came out in 2003, 2002 and three, basically. Um, it looks, well, let's see, here we go. It goes. It's a DVD? It's a DVD ROM. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I'll just show you a few minutes, talk about it, then I'll show you the new one. Only because it's at least they bracket each other and, they're, and it starts with. Or just go quit, right? Quit. That's quit. Just quit, yeah. Quit. Well, it's not a it doesn't know either. It's just a chicken. It's not actually a thing. It's not actually a sentient being. That's the opening. And then, uh, that, then it, it breaks into chapters. It's nice. And the sun, I, uh, I think Elizabeth said she studied with Andres Coffee, right? It was yeah. done near here, actually. You know, Labyrinth used to be near it, here in Germany, right? And then we get to the table of contents eventually. And it's taking a while. Okay, and then the opening, right, the preface of the story. An elderly woman, and something of what I told you, right? So let's suppose we move along just to maximize time here. That help, you want know, the table of contents. I got table contents. That's what I want now. Continue? I guess so, yes. So click yes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's just uh, such the sudden end of night there of knowing that at all times you are in a scripted space. Right? <laughs> the illusion of free will and <laughs> yeah. yeah, badly scripted space. So, so, so what do you have to do? I'm trying to, trying to just work? open into the contents, yeah. Huh. Why is that not Why is it? Um, why is it that happening? Well, the story? Okay, maybe I'll work. Mm -hmm. well, where are the images? Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem to want to behave, does it? It just doesn't want to behave. I wonder why. Anyway, what, what, what would follow <laughs> is um, you go to the table of contents, you'd see chapters, which you're not seeing, right? Mm -hmm. Why is it not continuing? That's what I don't understand. I don't know. What um, is and, and then you'd see me in the corner talking. But you're supposed to see, be able to move the images. See, we're, we're locked in the uh, opening. The right. What's down there? Huh? Those boxes on the lower right or not? I think. Uh, well, one is help, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, here, no, that, that's the no, that's No, that only shows you how it works. That shows you how the program works, but that actually doesn't take you to the... Uh, yeah. yeah, these are all different operational things that you can do. But you're, you're supposed to be clicking from one image after the other. For some reason, it doesn't want to do that. There's probably something that needs to be loaded on this computer. Like yes. A, a software that is not on the computer, or does yeah. That... Well, let's not yeah. worry too much about it. But the idea uh, to, to explain how it works, you you have images in an aperture with the voice over, and you simply operate them and enter them in a in a rhythm, and the space between the mental the mental picture made by these. These images then give you a feeling of a kind of student of consciousness novel. <laughs> it operates in, in uh, three chapters in the first tier. After the first tier, you now know enough that you want to learn more about Molly's story. So you go to the second tier, then you learn more background about her family and her life. Then the third tier, you're ready to make a movie and discover that Molly didn't like movies. And each time you put the camera down, it doesn't look like her life. So it basically becomes a critique of photo and cinema. So essentially what you wind up with is photo and cinema are a way to forget a way to erase. You can't really see the scene through photo and cinema. You, you can only operate differently. And, and it goes on and on. 
it, it, it travels on. <coughs> in fact, there, there's an article just written on it again in London in January, and then I guess they're doing something in Germany about it. And uh, this is frustrating. I don't know if it's what you want to say. I'm not frustrated, but I know yeah, a lot of people. So let's just move on. Okay. Life is wanna... convoluted and bizarre, right? <laughs> and there's no getting around it. Yeah. So let's just exit. But um, um, now, right near here is that there's something called the Labyrinth Project, uh -huh. Rosemary Camilla. Within, within half a mile of here, they have operational versions of this, and it's traveled. That they operated in Germany then. It's nominated in Transmediali, it's nominated in Japan. It won a prize in Croatia. So the Croatian bit, you know, let's go for this. In Croatia, they can say we can. Yeah, 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 this is it's just uh, ironic, but that's okay. <laughs> well, let's put another disc in. Yeah. Uh, yeah how, do I, how do I exit? Well, I don't, I'm not sure how you exit this. Oh, I think, I think they want you to read this for a while before it exits, but how do I exit the disc anyway? Top right. Top right? I want you to exit, right? Okay. And, 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 now that, and I'll show you some of the new one, right? But surely, I hope, I hope this is going to work. Let's say. Well, if not, then I'll just do a shadow puppets and you know, <laughs> you know, or I'll read some things or you know. Um, so I, let me show you some of the images briefly from the from the. Let's see something that that is definitely this has got to. Be fine, but I have this something, something that's very straightforward. Yes, yeah. it's just a straightforward DVD ROM file with Let's images. Say. There's no possible way this Let's won't say. happen. Yes, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm happy. I'm, it's not only my neurotic areas. So, what did you put in? Right now. Uh, this is um, these are some of the images of from what we discovered. We went through ninety thousand images to try to understand what people thought the future would be from the eighteen seventies or eighties until through the nineteen twenties. What they thought the new century was going to look like, and we selected twenty two hundred images to make this novel. That again is in three tiers and uh, four tiers actually. This one. And uh, the first two tiers are. I think you should probably go up there and explain it. Yes, and I'll, show, I'll just show some. So rather than show you the interface or whatever, I'll just show you some of the images so at least we actually see something. And this is kind of the simplest uh, of all, right? There we go. Well, I can make that bigger, but is that okay for right now? Just leave it like this. This is uh, what we discovered is when the telephone first developed, they were quite convinced that there would very soon be a visual telephonoscope where public life could invade your privacy in a, in a peaceful way. So this is a kind of soft porn version right, of going to the vaudeville but staying at home. It was called a telephonoscope. There are hundreds of images of what they thought the telephone would represent uh, and, and what kind of collapse of the public, public world or the up in the spirit of what they're doing would happen. And that, that's from the 1880s. I have notes on it, but I don't want to keep maximizing time. It's later. Oh, this one looks bigger. Yeah, this is also this one around 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 1890s. This was uh, going to be the the automatic restaurant. This is before Pontiac Claire, before all that, the, and and even before the development of um, uh, the Ford assembly line. What they thought the coming of the industrial world was going to do to people's sense of community or connection. Um, pretty great, right? Mm -hmm. And obviously taking a department store and turning it into a replacement for the, for the city itself. So, I did, um, nice, huh? 
How do you say the movie Wally? Because yes. they actually have people yes. in their yes. own. This is 1890s. Yeah, no, it's not. Exactly um, well, what you find when you. There is a kind of misremembering. If you're talking about memory, we do have versions of the future that never quite happen as we think they would. And then they continue to haunt us in a science fiction and fantasy. One of them is how automated would, I, you know, would the city actually become? Well, it never became automated enough. But you know, memory. Norman, well, can I ask you the standard of the light so we can actually get you, we can see your face a little better? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to maximize the time. I know, music. but I, I don't want to confine you. I don't want to. Um, I'm fine. You know. I'll just keep going. I don't want to engage in discipline and punishment. I just want to be <laughs> <laughs> so now it's fine. Hold the incense, but uh, just so we can see your face. I'll oh, find fine. Okay. I'm so used to, um, it's a cow arts habit to do it i just inside. Uh, this is right before, in the period right before the First World War. They knew the war was coming, but they didn't actually understand it. In a strange way, when you see nightmares of the future, the purpose of seeing the nightmares of the future is so you can have dinner afterward and not expect it to happen. This is uh, Universal War with a French officer playing playing his his uh, uh, organ. If you, well, that sounds like a bad pun, but he's playing 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 obviously a, a kind of pipe organ that is sending out uh, missiles. Now you can you can see all the uh, the echoes of what finally does happen. But the irony is that this is fairly close to the coming of the First World War. Not exactly a real sense of how bloody it was going to be, but almost all the detailing of the artillery, the books that came out, we found at least 20 or 30 books detailing the Great War, as the British called it. But then there was the Great War of 1897, uh, 1907, and even 1911. And then when the Great War happened, it was an infinite surprise. So that might tell us something about um, how how shocked we were, right? In 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 Liverpool, I gave a talk last April. At the end of the talk, I said, "It's pretty clear, following the logic of what I just said, there will be a giant crash within the next year." Don't worry, buckle up. You're young. Your future is here. You know, but it will be terrible, right? <laughs> and I just left. And then people got shocked afterward. Then I took an ambient in an airplane and the guy said it. I can't remember ever saying it. And, and then I, I came back to Liverpool in the end of October. And you can imagine, you know, people wanted me to comment more on what I said. I, so who knows how many versions of this I've done myself. It's true, forgetting right there. Absolutely, yes. I, I think it's very easy to, I, I think every one of us have examples of where we more or less predicted this was to happen. But somewhere in the theatricality of it, another version of a kind of scripted space, I guess, on, on their own terms, but we, we don't quite face up to what, what it implies. There's, there's a lot of this. These images are really nice, though. Mm -hmm. It's sort of amazing. At least we can see them. It's this fast machine. Here it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go fetch, and then go go. There's the chips. Yeah, and and the, the, uh, oh, well, I can lean a little bit over here. This is um, the obsession with with um, the body, and one sense of anxiety and alienation varies. I mean, in our culture, um, we have this obsession with medication and how medicated the body can be, and how and how we feel we have to be in a state of calm. Their obsession was that you have to deal with the nervousness of the world and that you should have a body without fatigue, but at the same time it caused illnesses. The illnesses of modern life, particularly to the upper middle classes, was called neurasthenia. Edith Wharton had neurasthenia. Proust had neurasthenia. But uh, not the person who served him lunch. He was fine. <laughs> it goes on and on. In fact, Edith Wharton was treated with neurasthenia by being constantly massaged because they felt it was bad for her to exercise. So they they almost like a serving class, they exercised her for herself. You know, it was very odd. But this is a German version of anxiety, nervousness. There's a lot of feeling that early cinema somehow responds to this also. It's called hyperstimulation, maybe some of this thing. Let's see what else. What else? 
No, we don't have the other one. That's the comparison. I mean, and the now, oh yeah, this is. See, here's what's peculiar about this. Yes, it is true. In 1910, in Los Angeles, they had something that's called the air, an air meet, and they have one every year. But if you look at this image more carefully, you see that it's absolutely all artificial. You can see a tree that's stuck in the side. <laughs> the wheel is wrong. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's kind of wonderful uh, paste up, right? And then, and, uh, the, the, then your mind starts racing and figure this out. It was about these postcards. You could make your own postcards. But, and then where are they flying? Where the hell is that? And, and that might be Ocean Park. It's hard to tell because that theme, music park's there. So a lot of obsession with the flight in this period. Can I throw out a question? Um, I'm, 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 I'm not jumping in here. I guess. Um, and it's sort of going back to what we were talking about in the first part of the class, which is, um, I don't mean to interrupt, but I just, no, no. something I wanted to get out. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to respond to the spirit of what's going on here, so I have one question. Well, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about on, on what's been described quite a few years ago as un, uneven development, uneven development. Uh, uneven development in terms of, 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 of cities and, 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 of course, economic demographic disparities and development, yes. whatever that means. Um, and the question, in my mind, becomes increasingly, well, if, we're, if we are moving into a fairly prolonged recession, um, yes. perhaps even a kind of minor, minor depression. Something serious and long, long, long five years let's or so or more. Um, five to twelve years. Okay, that, that, that it's no longer an issue of uneven development, which is which is a, a kind of phrase that Rosalind Deutsch came up with yes. in the late nineteen eighties. Yes. But now we have sort of de-development or or, or yes. So I wonder what you think about the prospects of what happens after, in a crash situation after uneven development has raised its. You know, yes. Kind of I mean, I, I, I'm trying to figure this out. I, I think I understand the gist of it. Yeah. That, that uneven development also has to do with the, with the idea that globalism, despite how ruthless industrialism was, world wars and all the rest of it, right? It it seemed to have generated a kind of middle class. Right. And despite all the glamour of globalism, it obviously has shrunk the middle class. That's the simplest way of putting it. And and generated a kind, what I call a kind of electronic baroque. Kind of a kind of early feudal, late feudal state, and now we're watching the very people who have this kind of money, who have these this kind of resource, no, it's okay. Have it's these kind of resources, uh, crashing themselves, and we're wondering. So we lost the industrial model of the state. Yes. Okay, that's gone. We lost the industrial model of the city for the most part. Yeah. We. We generated some kind of city on, on the skin of old buildings and artificial surfaces and a, a power grid that was so, so um, horizontal. And now, suddenly, that horizontality has crashed and it, that old fellow, old friend in the back of the room that we used to make fun of, owns everything. <laughs> it turns out the nation state, which was the, what uneven development was suggesting, has, has, is the only player left for the time being, and we don't know how that will play out because we know that that won't operate for very long. So we're going to see a, a tremendous sociological adjustment, and we just don't know how that plays out because does that mean that we're going to actually see uh, an evening out after the, the <laughs> I mean, the, 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 like the idea of the depression sort of generating eventually a larger middle class than what existed in the 20s. My, my guess is that, if I had to guess, unfortunately, is that this feudal class structure will continue when the smoke clears. Um, I don't see how it can be adjusted very much because the kind of remedies that are going on are mostly to prop up the top. And the attempts to sort of mediate the bottom are going to be fairly modest. Um, so, what somehow we're going to wind up with a more um, the next stage of this 
much more uneven class structure. I, I, you, 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 I, I can't imagine that, that people that it's going to condense suddenly that, that, that there aren't going to be more poor people, right? There will be, obviously, yeah, because yes. the people will fall out of the middle and more about class into. Yes. Like, you know. So I think we're going to have, we're heading toward, uh, that, that's the crisis that uh, Obama and, and all political systems in the West face that democracy was still based on the idea of a relatively growing middle class, despite all the unevenness and the cruelties and the rest of all the ruthless, the, the ruthless issues we know about. And now we're going to obviously see a process that isn't fundamentally democratic, that is about class difference and power differentiated. And I hardly think that this moment of the nation state having a few, uh, a few years, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> to sort of flex and readjust is going to change this process completely. And it's possible we may wind up with, with, with a more of an Asian model of class structure in the end. So I, 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 I'd like to, a part of my heart is hoping, of course, being a kind of neo-retro socialist personality, right? that this, this will somehow generate a more egalitarian, closer to a more egalitarian enlightenment kind of, it, kind of model. But I, I get this feeling that there's so little traction that the Enlightenment sort of ended. Uh, I want to see what's going to be reinvented in the next few years, but uh, many people are, are <coughs> worrying, right, when that the only answer will be a class structure even wider than we have now. Because obviously... Well, I, 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 and, and even wider? I would, uh, well, well, not necessarily that much better. The, the point is more people are going to fall into a level of poverty. The, class, the state system, it has a lot to do with how long it takes, right? Mm -hmm. If it happens only three or four years, if it's that lucky, but what if it does go on 12 to 15 years? The adaptations are going to be just amazing. I, I just don't know how that works. Um, so I, you, you don't see that there will be, well, in those adaptations that you're referring to in terms of how, let's say, things play out. Let's say, let's look as you discussed earlier in terms of downtown Los Angeles. Let's okay. look at things how, how let's That's talk about easy. the imaginary future, a projection yeah. of, and yeah. I actually think that the image behind you is appropriate, just in general. Yeah, well this is, yeah, this was, uh, this is an LA image, it's, uh, LA went into a giant building uh, infrastructure boom in the 20s and this man is sort of announcing it. It's a great image, right? Pipe for any purpose, you know. So let's, I mean, let's use downtown LA or whatever we, yeah, however I mean, that, uh, is that a model we've been working with that? that well, I mean, it's, it's something that, that return, I think it well, seems to I, preoccupy people uh, because uh, it's so uh, contradictory. Uh, my, my interest is, my, my feeling is that downtown LA grew to its maximum more or less in the mid to late 20s and can only represent about a million people and can never be a downtown for the city at large. And that LA increasingly, dis, despite uh, other, other issues, that seem to have melted the west side and the east side is going to break up into these units that I mentioned in the, in the book. And that we're probably going to see a kind of east side, the east or east side city, and um, we'll have to see how that develops. So I, I can actually see the new Byzantium being one, one city and then the west side um, being another, and 15 years pass with, with relatively little, you know, mixing. So we have another 15 years of patterns, right? that go from one to the other. I mean, I, I went, I, I was asked by Dana Cuff, you know, she's this architectural uh, scholar, to come and visit people at UCLA. And I said, I can't go to UCLA. He said, why can't you go to UCLA? He said, I'll never get back. <laughs> he said, oh, you just have to come and chat with us. I said, I can't chat with you. I'll never get back. <laughs> it's about two hours sometimes to get back. I, I, I know every sneaky way back. I can't get back. You know, he said, well, maybe I could meet, we could meet you downtown. And he said, we can meet you downtown, and so we're not going to see each other. <laughs> I mean, it, it was just too much, our, our schedules were just too impossible. And we're just, you know, UCLA in here, you know, and, and Los Angeles. I, I think that many cities, the only solution will be to break down into subaltern units. Say, and in other words, the suburbs in themselves won't be able to, to manage to survive in the way they have. And the downtown areas have been fractured in a certain way. Business and structure and the cities and the counties or whatever, I think you'll see subaltern cities still of, a, of no more than 800,000 
probably the logical solution. I, I can't imagine how there's enough resources to build that very thing again. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe suburban cities would be nice, right? Uh, but, but, uh, I, I don't see how downtown LA will be the capital of this new subaltern city necessarily. Do you, when you say subaltern, you're referring to in relation to economy, as in relation to class, in relation to well, I, in relation to, 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 the, to the well, we're we'll talking about cities now, right? right? Cities. I mean, Los Angeles was a small river city that absorbed 30, about 37 small towns, and then many about 30 other unincorporated districts. That was so so small and so irrelevant that they didn't even have towns to them. They just, they just forgot to mention it. They used that mostly for, uh, for you to get drunk and get stoned a little bit more easily. Right? And, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, West, West Hollywood was an unincorporated district. That's why I was able to call itself a town. And so it, it was always, uh, it had this kind of scattered process. It grew just at the time when other cities grew, when New York grew, when Berlin grew, 1890s to what, 1920s when these cities expanded a lot. And I think that the circumstances are going to throw them back into their former, oh, their former models. They'll, they'll, they'll break, break apart into, into smaller models within, within the, the, uh, the system because uh, the economy is going to be slow enough that people will have to withdraw into smaller models. And in 15 years, those will become just a little bit more familiar than they are already. So my guess is that. Um, um, parts of Manhattan and Brooklyn will be one one city, right? Uh, parts of uh, Harlem in the Upper East Side will be another city. Parts of Chicago. I mean, I think this will happen. But you don't know sort of enclave-like uh, cities? Yeah, or enclave. In other words, at a certain point, that's what it was anyway. When these when these absorption process were, was happening, when the five boroughs were joined, they really weren't a unified city to the degree they were by the 1950s. But I think they're going to be, be sort of slip back toward models that are closer to the way they were when they were first being, being uh, uh, glued together. Uh, I think the east end of London and the west end of London will become more separated. I think cities will have, that might be a nice thing, cities will have m more differentiated uh, uh, culture within, within them than they've had in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think they'll be quite as vertical as they, as they were before. I think that was destroyed by globalism enough. So we're going to have some sort of an interesting, an interesting new set of terms we're going to have to come up with. Right? And if, if the eastern end of LA and the western end of LA become separated enough that uh, they almost have cultural differences, institutions that don't, the hammer's here, and this is here, and that for whatever the cultural areas are, we're, we're going to see a very different kind of uh, urban experience. And maybe that will be OK, you know, because it, it it, it might allow for, for for an interesting energy, but I think it's going to be difficult. It's a humpy dumpy thing. Almost. It's going to be difficult to piece together the vertical city just because suddenly Obama has eight hundred billion dollars. That's not going to be enough to put it back. Yeah. And and I don't think that the economic engine that that uh, which was separating them anyway is going to be stopped. And but I'd like to think that that would mean that local and neighborhood and smaller smaller unit time, uh, units of culture will exist. And maybe in a way that'll be fine. The bookstores are disappearing, right? The, the theaters are becoming harder and harder to support. A lot of the, uh, the cafes are what? We're going to talk about coffee now? This is, the, this is the definition of urban life, whether you can get a good cup of coffee somewhere. I mean, that, that seems pretty pathetic. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm more or less willing to look forward to the east side, of, eastern edge of Los Angeles becoming the new Byzantium. I'm willing to argue for it, right? And that, that it has some kind of future and, and it has to find its own, um, shall I say, cultural support system. And the, um, uh, we'll have to see how, how it plays out. Um, I, I, it, it's, the, I'm, I'm sure every city has an equivalent. I'm going to Mexico City late this month. I've been there a few times. And, and <coughs> that's another city pasted together <coughs> and completely you know, it's metastasized to something. Colossal, I mean, 23 million or whatever. It and it's, but, but when you're in a certain district, that's it, you know? Mm -hmm. You're not in Mexico City. I mean, you're in just a, a, little, a little oval, right? <clears throat> and you live in that oval, and that oval has a certain, 
coherence. I think cities might be slipping back toward uh, a model, right? It, and that would suggest that there is more of a pressure from sort of what one would describe as a grassroots. Or I hope so. Bottom, bottom up as opposed to homogenizing forces. So, and from your mouth to God's ear. <laughs> that would be, be my argument. But I'm too much, I mean, I, I'm a, a kind of a paranoid utopian. <laughs> I, I do, I, I'd like to argue that this would happen, mm -hmm. but I'm too much of a, of a hard-boiled character in terms of my critical critical function to simply say, oh yes, that will happen. I realize that there are many reasons why it won't, but I'd like to think that a more grassroots version right, of, of, of cultural life might be possible in this world, and even slightly more interest in, in civic spaces, that's what I mentioned, and, and the, the unused, um, shall we say, cultural capital that has been completely ignored by globalism. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by civic space? Well, um, well um, obviously, if you start with um, the parks in Paris, the uh, a central park, let's use central park as the obvious um, sort of paradigm. Central park developed in the 1850s, it's obviously for social, sociological reasons to separate rich and poor and, and I mean, to, to put lungs into the city. We know all that business. And then it has something to do with what's called the City Beautiful. And the City Beautiful presumably was to add civic parks with industrial parks to build a kind of um, na na nature's workshop, which is probably what they call even Los Angeles. LA never had a City Beautiful model. Um, Chicago does to some extent. You can see it along the lake. New York obviously does, uh, Minneapolis does. Um, uh, there's a garden city model in London there, you know, in, in parts of England. But um, now, now all of that's disappeared. It's so far away, you know. And it would be hard to imagine that you could take a civic space and make it into a living space the way a shopping mall or the grove is. But I think that maybe because of the nature of things, maybe, maybe people with your background, maybe there'll be an opening, right? to take variations of civic spaces, to not the downtown hubs, but corners and, and, and alleys and other things. Like, like what they did with Bergamot Station, in a way, that's a kind of a successful example. That was a kind of depleted space that was a civic space because no one else wanted it. But maybe to begin to, to uh, start an infill uh, because it looks like consumer-driven culture will, will have to um, hyperventilate and shut down. <laughs> well, there's a bit of a, the, the problem, yeah, I mean, I, you know, there's, there's often discussion about the relationship of, of the art culture to the development of neighborhoods, for example. There's been a lot of discussion in relation to Culver City, for example. Yeah, which, um, which is a kind of success, uh, though a lot of the restaurants are going to start closing down. Still, you know. Right. I mean, so there is this, 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 you know, kind of interpenetration of business, whether it's, you know, smaller entrepreneurial efforts yes. and the reconstitution or the constitution of a particular kind of neighborhood yes. um, or zone that actually can support and, and, artists and, and art. And some seem more successful than others. Culver City would seem like a su success. It would seem like a success, but, it's pre but, but of course, if it's predicated partially on the gallery system for, as, one of the, as one of the engines, and if that begins to contract, then what happens? I mean, so that yes. you know. what happened? I mean, it, it, there's always this story. Oh, when 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 New York went bankrupt, that's when art really took over. Uh, Perry Holman, who was, who was near here, uh, said yeah. said, the, said the other week. He said, "Well, you know, when times like this, people who really want to be in art actually stay in art, and the people who think that they're just for the money, well, I don't know. That sounds so utopian to me." But I don't, I don't know what will happen if the, if the contractions in the gallery system... I mean, I know that in New York, a lot of it was relying on, on this financial world money. The financial world was supporting a lot of the gallery world in New York. And I can't imagine how it must feel. It must, it must be literally like a, a solar plexus, you know, kind of effect. <laughs> because to, to lose 40,000 people who, you know, potentially were interested in buying art, you know. Uh, so I, I, I don't know what the adaptation will be. Um, the traditional arguments are that in moments like this, culture becomes more introspective, it, it, it slows down, and it develops um, uh, an energy 
uh, that in a way is almost incubational and, and it becomes more powerful as a result. I, I'm more than happy to put my hand up and vote for that. I, I realize that my other hand is telling me something else, my leftist critical hand, right? But um, uh, I, yes, I think that to some degree maybe that will be true. But how, how do people make a living? How do they make make ends meet? Exactly. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to, to be utopian and say, oh, artists, they don't need money. And I said, oh, really? Is this, have you been at Trader Joe's lately? Are they giving away food to artists? I mean, <laughs> oh, sure, you're an artist. Yeah, take some cheese, you know? I mean, well, that, the, 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 I just want to, I mean, the, 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 uh, I'll put it this way, the, the, the lack of rigor of anybody who would claim that, well, in these times, those, you know, the people who will stick around are serious agents of culture or whatever. But this is an argument that we've heard, I've heard for a couple of decades now in terms of contraction. It's not quite as, you know, hard this as this. Unusual. This is very unusual. The New York one was very big in the 70s and 80s. But, but, but there's, a, there's an intrinsic falsehood to this, I think. Precisely because we, there has been adaptation to a new, for better or worse, neoliberal market model. And if you, if you pull the rug out from out of that, yeah. um, know. you know, the, the, you're throwing out, you know, everything. But the, uh, the baby goes out with yes. the passport. No, I, so. I understand. I, and I don't know. Not you, but what? I mean, no, no, I, no I, I, I completely understand. And I think it would be unbelievably hypocritical for me to pretend that's not so. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Um, so I, I, I really wonder. I wonder, I mean, what do you think is, I mean, <laughs> You're, you're, you're I'm, well, I mean, I, I'm, it, it's it's going to take about a year or two to actually see this, to see how deep, you know, when your toe at least touches the bottom, you're still drowning, but it's well, a lot easier to I, I, think, I think this is an issue that, that, that requires further analysis and uh, discussion, uh, maybe not tonight, but, but no. in other situations in which the idea that, that, that art and culture is functions as, a, as an incubator for yes. urban development, that model itself, I think, needs to be problematized. Yes. Not, in a, not in a vulgar way, but in a very, you know, I, I to think that right. through because, if, because where does that actually lead us? Yeah, I'm, and I'm not sure whether what art does actually incubates ur urban life. I just, I mean, if you can get 70 cents for a square foot, then you live there if you're an artist. That doesn't mean you urban pioneer the But the, there's an idea that if you plant artists somewhere, you're going to grow a culture. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't work. You know. I think the only example that they like to use is, of course, uh, Southern Manhattan. And I don't think it was the artist that made Southern Manhattan happen. But that was an engineer. I mean, that, that, was, that, that was not engineered. That, 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 I mean, that's the issue of the difference between yes. so-called, maybe this is a bad word, organic processes in which, out of necessity and survival, people migrate to certain areas due to, you know, yes. the rent or the or, or cost. And what seems to happen more and more in various cities, not only LA, but elsewhere, but, but this kind of, you know, the, the kind of, like sea monkeys, you, you sprinkle the water and all of a sudden you generate a, a kind of culture in a community or a neighborhood. Yeah. And, and, and no, I don't think that's, I, I, so the adaptations are going to be very, very peculiar. I can see a lot of artists leaving cities because it's going to be so cheap to live outside of cities suddenly for the first time in a long time. Mm -hmm. I could see people, artists moving completely, you, you know, why, why should I pay, you know, uh, $1,200, $1,500 a month rent right, when I can't do it, right? And there's no art world for me to meet that much except once, once every three months. Why don't I go out to some, you know, uh, nowhere place? I, 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 yeah, I don't, I'm not convinced that there's any real argument that artists have ever built a neighborhood simply by living there. I, um, I live in Highland Park, and people have this illusion, for example, that Highland Park is changing because Anglos and artsy music types are moving in. Well, I've been watching more carefully. It's, it, it was the working class Latinos who bought into the neighborhood for years, for about eight, eight or nine years, and they're, they're the ones, by ratio of maybe eight to one, right? who have actually taken the neighborhood from a very, very serious, seriously unpleasant environment. You know, I mean, we're talking serious shit was happening. You know, people just walked through your front window, <laughs> stone. You know, I, mean, you know, I mean, there's a certain point where you said, this isn't cute, this is dangerous, this is unpleasant. Uh, to something where I can see balance, but if I look around, I, I don't see this flood of, you know, uh, 
art consciousness people <laughs> are rebuilding. In fact, on my street, the artists buy native plants, and then the Latinos rebuild their houses. You know, they, I found almost all the real rebuilding was done by Latino and contractor people. Now, what's going to happen next is very hard to identify. But um, yeah, there is this myth that artists build neighborhoods. Uh, I, I'm not sure you can historically argue that almost ever. That uh, I think neighborhoods are built uh, by by people who might include artists. Well, I, I think artists, so. I'm willing to see culture, are, art, art culture, and cities as two different things. Well, art, I mean, artists like other kinds of cultural workers and just yes. workers generally move around to find places of inhabitation. Yes. I was just thinking about Donald Judd and Martha. Um, oh, in terms of like constituting his own city or. or like this artist tours of destiny. Yes, yes, I understand. Is that, and, and also I have to say, having been in the art world for 695 years, mm -hmm. I often find artists, in a strange way, are not community neighborhood oriented as much. They're more built around their own own community, their, their own <laughs> market system. Well, the Judd example is interesting in this slide because he, I mean, that was not about Re really, yeah, he built that to get away, right? I mean, to get away, I mean, to, to constitute his own kind of universe, if you will, and world, and and and, um, uh, and he did it because he had the cultural capital and the material capital that facilitated this. Um, so, I mean, that's yeah. It's a it's a pretty it's a pretty sticky argument to make. But, but, but if you just make an argument, if, if the artists are, as, as I said, let's say today, um, specialists in humanizing alienation and slowing down vision and trying to give some sort of, uh, um, uh, some sort of honest, honest, honest look at the world, um, then I think this could be a great moment for, if the material is just unbelievable. We are a comedy on a tragic scale. There's something so weirdly, almost funny, bizarre, I mean, about the Cheneys and the Bushes. And, the, and even now, the whole weirdness of the politics in Washington, it's just endless material, endless opportunity to say things. I don't know how that works out in terms of actual cities, but I think there are going to be opportunities coming out of this relatively introverted, introverted quality that cities are going to have to take. You're going to have to look into their own resources a lot more. And I, so I'll, 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 I'll take my utopian hand and then my paranoid hand, right? And speak to yes, um, I just wanted to go back to downtown for a second. Um, in the history of forgetting, there was a point you were talking about social imaginary, and you said something along yes. the lines of, you know, that all urban planning involves some form of social imaginary yeah, or whatever. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little about um, what exactly that imaginary thing is downtown in terms of, I mean, I guess it relates a little um, bit to the art culture, yes. like this idea of these moths that are going to somehow create something that's complete. I yes. mean, it's obviously, you know, this facade for, I mean, it's like there's, it's all there, but I just wonder if you could well, talk a little bit. If I took you through a, 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 a like a 90 second, 90 second whistle, whistle stop in downtown, right? Um, if you imagine, how, how it developed and how from the very beginning there was, because of the booster nature of Los Angeles, because of the way they, the promotional quality, because they felt that they are outrunning, it's a whole complicated business. I'll, I'll have to pretend that you understand what I mean by boosterism. But that they always tried to make downtown look like more than it was. And many people in the 20s would go to downtown, um, all of these film people, and they all say the same thing. They said, what the hell is this? They come from another place, right? Because it's so much smaller than Chicago downtown, for example. And, and the, 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 they're constantly trying to remake it into something that it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a relatively regional hub, but not for the entire area. And never really was able to do that, because the area was held together by a trolley system, right? That more or less looped north in, in a balloon route kind of thing, and then had rural agricultural center that was filled in in the 20s. Do you know what I mean? There's no historical way to identify downtown that way. As of 1920, maybe maybe more than two-thirds of LA lived close to downtown because the city hadn't filled in the 
the rural areas yet, of Hollywood and so forth. But by 1930, it was down to way less than 50%, more like 35%. And that was it. And then, what's only 35% of a city lives in the proximity like that? And, you, and even though it continued to grow into the 40s, it's clear it's only been a regional downtown. So then they kept trying to make it into something else. So then they thought, well, let's make it into Manhattan, right? So they built an imaginary Manhattan. And it looks very strange on a clear day. It's sort of like it was dropped by 95 witches. In it. Mm -hmm. You expect to find dead corpses of witches underneath. What they, well, downtowns are supposed to be up against the river or, or a mountainside. Or what is this little outcropping, right, of about 25 buildings doing there? It, it's it's very, like Broadway. The, the, um, the, 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 tall, Broadway. the tall vertical downtown that they built in the 80s, you know, which you see at okay. night, okay. Um, which is perfect for, let's say, assassination scenes in, in, in adventure movies. You know, it means they show it, they make a sound, then you shoot somebody, right? Or car commercials. Yes, it, 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 it has some. Uh, I had one, this guy Jankowski, he, he blew up downtown in special effects. Yeah. yeah, he came, to the, I, I, I talked with him, he came by and asked me for advice on how to blow it up and, you know, like, what to do, and we, we, we discussed it. I, I should show that video, Chris Jankowski did this wonderful uh, video of, uh, it just shows him walking down in, through the streets of downtown LA, yeah. carrying on actually a screen, or what we discover is a screen, which he sets up on a roof, or appears to set up on the roof of a building in downtown and screens this film. And the film, the screens, and if there's nothing on the film, and in the background we see one of the large uh, skyscrapers in Death and LA just yeah. collapse. He had enough money for one real great special effects shot. He, that's what we talked about. He said, I have enough money in my budget for just that. And which one should we do? And, and he had this idea. It's, 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 it's a very interesting It's, it's an interesting film. I wrote, I wrote for the catalog also. I, I don't know. But back to this issue that Mia raised, which is, I mean, as somebody who uh, rented for a period of time in downtown and spent yes. unheard of amounts of money in a, uh, a condo. Uh, you bought a condo downtown? No, of course not. I rented. Which oh, is almost, it's almost as that. stupid as buying one, yeah. but I rented. It's almost as <laughs> stupid. Uh, and burned through a lot of money yes. um, for these kind of corporate style condos in which they're trying to appeal to professionals and, yes. you know, like younger professionals and, I guess, middle aged professionals. Um, you know, huge amounts of money. And people are buying these, or have been buying these places. Yes. Now, what's going to happen, you know, in the next few years, who knows? But um, it, it seems that the entire development scheme itself was entirely misguided. Yes. And Absolutely. based on this, this profoundly a um, uh, perverted notion of neoliberalism that, that yes. could never, never function, even in the best possible and, world. And it was an ima first they imagined uh, um, midtown Manhattan, then they imagined that they could rebuild a fake southern Manhattan, right? A low build a large culture. A lot of culture. Right, I guess the point that I was trying, or I was I'm hoping sorry. to talk more yeah. about was just this idea of like, what is this, this imagined, what, what are the like ways, because I mean, you know, LA has a, really confused identity, you know, like I'm sure yes. that Hollywood plays into some of these well, social yeah. well, that, I'm sure that it has to do yeah. with it, uh, uh, outside of traditional city scales and just all of these things yes. that LA, you know, supposedly lacks or like well, is inferior well, in all these other ways. Supposing I, 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 I invert your question okay. for the sake of clarity at late at night, right? Yeah. LA yeah. is a much yeah. more neighborhood driven city, right? Than people realize because almost everyone doesn't go more than five like more than two miles out of their house, or two miles out of their house. It's, huh? It's never yeah, <laughs> and so, um, and also, it has a history of being very, very localized because of the way it grew in these little patches, right? I mean, you have to imagine how small these patches were. And that, the last one was Eagle Rock, one of the last ones. Eagle Rock in the twenties finally got rid of its stagecoach and, and put in a trolley for a population of six hundred. So, so we have to really get this idea of how how deemed that right the, the, the patch quilt, the quilt was and and putting it together. On, on the other hand, LA did have a downtown economic orbit up until 1930 or so. But what happened is it was basically three urban blocks, if you will. One being the old River City, another being the beach town suburbs, and the third being this large. Agricultural district 
that's went all the way down from from the from the, from the mud flats and mud farming, right? Uh, pretty, pretty far south, uh, all the way up basically into the two valleys, these two ancient riverbeds, right? That were dried out, and, and then the, the basin being the riverbed. So uh, linking them together, you're, you're you're left with all these fantasies. But actually, LA is 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 in a certain strange way a very coherent city, right? If you understand what its roots are about, and don't try to imagine that it ha it had to had to be that way. Do you know what I mean? It, it grew, it was three different kinds of urban processes that grew together. And in a strange way, uh, they, they, even though if you drive through Glendale and Burbank and you go up to San, San Diego Valley, if you take photographs, they look like the same, you know, dingbat, hopeless. What the hell is this? You know, is this where you go to die? <laughs> or, or, um, but at the same time, they actually have unique histories uh, inside them. And, ethnographic histories, and I guess I, I love the layers of Los Angeles. It's a city of layers, and even if it doesn't have the collage and the vertical energy of other cities, the layers are extremely intimate and weird, and, and uh, I, I find, in a strange way, I could talk about LA more easily as a New Yorker, as if the New Yorker of my childhood is easier to find in LA than it is even in New York in a strange way. I had, um, my son lives in, I'm going to be staying in, in, in Harlem with him, you know, kind of, I mean, he, he loves New York, I, I walk through his New York, I, I, and it just doesn't feel like the New York of my childhood, and yet parts of LA do. So, in a strange way, underneath all of this gloss and all these imaginary versions, I find a very, very, you know, level and, uh, in a strange way, intimate city. But, you have to remember, all cities are about alienation. I mean, I remember as a child, the, the way you loved New York was talking about how you hated it. I never met anyone who said, I love New York. They all hated it. But they never left. I, I mean, part of, part of the greatness of any city is that, is that it, it's, it's a really bad marriage that you never leave. <laughs> and and L, LA has a little of that quality also. So I think I can find a kind of paradoxical humanity inside all of these contradictions. I'd like to see them head on, right? I'd like to talk about them straight, in a straightforward way. I, I'd like all cities to be seen that way. I love the contradictions. I like the fact that the world doesn't quite make sense. I, I of course, dream that somehow it'll, it'll become more egalitarian and coherent. But, but it's a wonderful experience. So, so I would even invert the question slightly, right? And say there is a kind of layered coherence. You know, LA is a city of layers rather than a city of different verticals, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with you. It was always this funky downtown. I mean, Rushton Keaton said when he went downtown, it smelled like wine. Well, that's kind of nice, but what he was really saying, it smelled like dead fruit. <laughs> I mean, so, 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 because the orchards around downtown, you know, and the other things that were growing were nearby. And so, so it, it's, a, it's an endless struggle, right? And, with, and building the freeway system and other things to sort of build it, build it. But I think they, if they had met, like I met the person who was in charge of downtown planning, of, of, um, and then was fired. As soon as he was fired, I wanted to interview him. It's great to fire, interview people and they're fired. And then they'll tell you all kinds of shit they never said otherwise. Went to Paru's, I remember that. Yeah. And, and he was telling me all these things, and then he said, don't you like the way that, <clears throat> that little Tokyo, the way it developed it? He said, you like that? You know, he kind of looked at me. He said, and you see, we stopped downtown at, uh, at the freeway. He said, you stopped downtown at the freeway? Do you actually think it's pretty to look at just, just the, the bones of that stupid freeway thing? So people can spit at you while they're driving, hit you with a bottle while they're out of the end of the car. I mean, I didn't quite say it that way, as you can imagine. Polite, you know, having lunch, you know. But, but, but I, I was just shocked, because if he had just let it alone, obviously downtown, being, because it's a horizontal city, downtown would have so, sort of been a mixed-use, sort of sprawl, crazy, but, but rather charming quilt, almost, almost like, 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 like the East End of London, really. this and that, this and that, and this and that. And it would have just spread all the way past, uh, let's say, Glendale Boulevard. Huh? And then it was heading in that direction. Why didn't he just let it happen? Huh? 
And now, now they've developed this, this weird, uh, you know, paranoia thing on the west end of downtown, and so they can never solve it. Really, what should have happened is downtown should have allowed to simply creep into Echo Park and Silver Lake, and, and they should have let them make, down. LA is best with, with a kind of mixed mixture of use and together, and when it happens that way, it, it has a certain energy, and there's a lot of topographical beauty in, in the way that downtown rises and falls, and, and uh, I, I think that's the future of the city. So I would argue, watch the contours of the city and stop trying to build some imaginary competition for New York or whatever. LA, LA is, is a world-class city. It doesn't need to pretend to be something else. Paris doesn't try to look like New York. And Beijing should never try to look like anything else either. Right? It's always a mistake. Yes, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I guess that's what I was... Yes, and, and, it, 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 and it's a mistake. You look like yourself. I think it's... I love the canyon effect of LA, don't you? I think it's the, the most beautiful part of LA is its, it's topographical irony. It's not a valley of it at all. It's, it's actually very complex, you know. And uh, um, in that sense, from, from, from a satellite, Pasadena apparently looks like the forest. It's so grown. Mm -hmm. LA's way greener than you think. Mm -hmm. So if they had only sort of watched in a macro biotic way, right? They would have done a way better job. So and, and LA's not a good city to plan that way. Well, I mean, I think that it's problematic because the, what did you say? Well, I mean, I think that it, it can't, no, or I don't know, people are going to have to realize the enormity of what the freeway actually serves, because I think it plays on the fact that the reason why they, the areas that they were designated to go on, like the 5, the 101, and, and like the 110, were essentially to create that gated community that you guys were talking about yes. um, back in the was, morning. There was, there was definitely. And so I think that those those freeways were purposely put in these yes. areas to block yes. the growth of yes, and the sprawl of downtown. And, so how and, do you propose that these well, communities I don't know are what to do. of that? I mean, um, like if you live in poor areas, it's unbelievable how many freeways. When I lived in Angelo Heights, I could get onto about eight freeways in three minutes. <laughs> you know, in Beverly Hills, they made sure no freeways, right? There was supposed yeah. to be, the, the plans were for freeway right between the two Santa Monica the, that, and did you notice they immediately built right on the right of way? They said, forget it, pal. You are not coming to Beverly Hills. You know? Well, because they're their own city. Yes, and they were able to do this. And so, so the poor districts have been um, forced almost to be uh, um, a kind of uh, an engine, right? Literally, almost like a dynamo engine for the rest of the city. They have to absorb a lot of this, this, this traffic and overpass. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know an easy way to solve that. One has to step back and really start asking, you know, well, how does that work? Especially since the freeway, I mean, there's really no, even though it's ideal, it's not really a practical way of just getting rid of the freeway. I mean, I no. obviously think, no, 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 in my opinion, no, no. that San is the largest border between these communities that are happening outside of LA and yes. LA itself. So, so that's why I return to the idea of what civic spaces can be at least worked with to rebuild these communities in any way. Where all this work on the LA River, um, I, I, I talked to I mentioned earlier, I, I talked to the LA River people once and they asked me they, they brought me out. Of course I said what they didn't want to hear. I have a knack for that apparently. <laughs> <clears throat> but what I, what I told them is that you should let the, the neighborhoods help you redevelop this and not worry so much about bringing it back to some place where you could canoe down, you know, like you were a, a fur trader or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and they, they kind of looked surprised. They said, you mean you want the neighborhoods to actually help read? Yes, I said, because they've been, they've been tortured by all the cement and all, and all these, the, the, these overpasses. And, and it, it's, it's unhealthy, it's ridiculous, and it's bad for the life. If you believe in a city, this is a bad thing. And I could see I couldn't get through there. Were, they had this, this kind of exceptionalist point of view, and they wouldn't see that. But, but the, the idea of the master planning. <coughs> They're going to master plan 50 miles of river, but not master plan um, the, the, 20, the 25 neighborhoods it went through. <coughs> but I think the idea of trying to rediscover, I'll, I'll give you another example, a okay, small example. I was asked to do a project with um, 
um, Central American kids, huh? and and uh, they they built this horrible computer game based on this project. And I I, t I was trying to teach them magic realist techniques, so they can come up with magic realist stories. And I said, if your neighborhood is a, is a neck is a necklace, come up with a story about the clasp, and tell me what the clasp is. It might be the lot across the street with a crazy old lady died. It could be anything. And they they develop these myths and and. Uh, it was interesting to sort of hear what made their streets work. Right? We need clasps again, right? The clasps of various neighborhoods are gone. And so probably this may be a moment because of the introspective reality of this shock of lack of capital. Maybe some of these civic spaces, we can actually use the term civic space again for the first time in about 70 years, right? Since I don't know when, because the obsession with getting rid of them and putting freeways through them, right? Mm -hmm. And making public spaces more privatized and getting rid of the main street phenomenon. I mean, we've been doing this for such a long time. I wonder whether it's, it's a, a moment between insanities where we can re-examine what the civic reality of the neighborhood, a smaller, a smaller yield, right, environment is about, and whether that's still also culturally relevant. Whether that can be masterpieces, you know, in, in, a, in a lower yield way. And, and, uh, and whether, in fact, all, all the people whose work we love lived in only about five square blocks, right? Proust never even left the room for about five, eight years, right? I mean, he got the opera from the telephone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think if you, I believe in the Baudelaire notion of modernity. If you own that one day, those 10 minutes, you will own it for a thousand years. Yeah, I think that's a good place. Unfortunately, we have yes. to turn into a close. Thank you. If you want to see the object, it's in the in, at Otis in, at the gallery there. And I, I think I'm going to be talking about the CIA. Which is, I suppose it's going to be yeah, moderating tomorrow at Oh yes, Hans 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 Hans